personality traits? And would this responsibility power primarily increase sexual harassment intentions through communal feelings, also moderated by responsibility focused traits, like we found in our previous study, uh, communal goal orientation? So for our participants, we had 102 self-identified LGBTQ US residents that were recruited off of TERF Prime. 29% were male, 65% bisexual, 15% identified as gay, 19% identified as lesbian, and 1% identified as queer. For our study design, we had eligible participants first complete individual difference measures, such as dominance, start triad, agentic, and communal goal orientation. Then we had them randomized into an egocentric focus, responsibility focus, or control power prime, which I'll be detail later in another slide. After the power priming, they would go into a state, they would then complete state feeling measures, such as sexy, powerful feelings and communal feelings. And afterwards, they would complete an intentions to sexually harass, which is the workplace cross scenario that measured unwanted sexual attention. For the scenario-based primes, um, we had used scenarios, which we had thought, had them imagine them being in the focal person described in each scenario. So each scenario des described a particular day, in including a description of themselves getting ready for work, going to work, and then af an after work behavior. So the ego and centric and the responsibility scenarios include elements to prime their respective forms of power. So for example, in the egocentric, Priming condition, the scenario had the person stressing themselves, getting ready, looking appealing for work, going to work, um, and making a pitch to senior leaders that have a positive impact on their own career growth, and then afterwards going to the bar with one of their administrative assistants. And then for the responsibility focus prime, we had them have use their influence to help others, um, mentor their employees, and socialize without alcohol after work with their employees. So any the complete opposite of the egocentric prime. And the control condition did not emphasize either responsibility or the egocentric elements of the other two prime, but it still did elicit this power prime. So for this is just a brief overview of some of the, the individual difference measures. So dominance, uh, measured dominance, domineering, dark triad, measured the three traits of narcissism, Machiavellianism, psychopathy, agentic goal orientation by Diekman, measured by power, success, recognition, and communal goal orientation, which is also by Diekman, um, they measured items such as altruism, serving community, and serving humanity. All right, and for our workplace crush scenario, we started each, every scenario started with a, um, reading a description where a focal person has a crush on a coworker who is not returning their affections. And a scale list is a number of behaviors to enact in regards to the subject of the crush. So it'll be 10 out of 41 scenarios, which are inappropriate. So one, for, for one example, it'd be like, I would continue to ask Matt or Melanie on dates even after he or she has said no. All right, for our results, both forms of power priming increase feelings of sexiness and powerfulness, which strongly predicted one's likelihood to sexually harass. Egocentric power was not stronger than responsibility power in, in increasing sexy, powerful feelings. Sexy, powerful feelings mediated the effect of egocentric and responsibility-focused power priming as compared to the control on attention to engage in unwanted sexual harassment, and which measured by the workplace questionnaire measure. And as predicted, the model was moderated by all three power focus traits. So genetic goal orientation, dominance, and dark triad. So to illustrate one of these effects um, of dark triad, all of these effects of, were similar. So all dark triad, dominance, and genetic orientation had the same kind of trends. So the, we saw that the paths and indirect fact paths for dark triad, one standardization above the mean and below the mean um, of both egocentric and responsibility priming media of sexually powerful feelings is significant at both levels, but becomes noticeably stronger for those who are higher in these traits. Um, so you can see this in the dark triad example. So right, for, power, for the power for hypothesis two uh, about responsibility focused power, power priming and especially po responsibility focused power priming increased community feelings, which in turn positively predicted at the trend level intentions to engage in unwanted sexual attention as measured by the workplace crush scenario. Furthermore, there was a trend for communal feelings to mediate the effect of relationship focused power priming compared to the egocentric power priming, 
compared to egocentric power powering on workplace questionnaires. Contrary to predictions, however, communal orientation did not moderate this pathway. So just to recap, this study did extend Stockdale and colleagues 2019 study in which power priming increased sexual harassment proclivities through sexy, powerful feelings, which was strengthened by power focused traits. So when LGBTQs were primed to feel powerful in an ego, uh, ego central centric or responsibility focused manner, their feelings of sexiness and powerfulness increased, which in turn increased their intentions to engage in USA or sexual harassment. These effects were stronger for those high in power focused traits. Although not fully replicated, there was a trend for the responsibility focused power priming to increase intentions to engage in unwanted sexual harassment through communal feelings. But our study does not come without limitations. Um, we did have a small sample size of LGBTQ participants of 102, which may have affected our power to find all of the hypothesized effects. Second, our study was conducted online entirely with self-report measures, and we're unsure whether these effects may replicate in a real-world setting which behavioral, with behavioral observations of sex harassment. Third, our study relied on, on a relatively new form of power priming. We mostly replicated the effects. We found out this method reported in our previous study, but we do not have the comprehensive evidence of contradict validity of this method of priming. For example, we are primary we were particularly interested in understanding whether our scenario-based priming maps onto actual situations in which people feel egocentrically empowered, such as being an autocrat or a star, or feel responsibility and power, such as being a teacher, a mentor, or a youth leader. So for future directions, we are interested in studying whether effects of responsibility power through communal feelings operate on the basis of moral licensing. For example, when someone feels empowered to be responsible to others, does it create this license to break bad? and engage in harassment. And my master's thesis, another Sigmund's unplug, will be exploring this possibility. Um, we are also planning to replicate our studies using the computer harassment paradigm, which will provide a behavioral method of testing our power priming effects. Um, third, you may have noticed that today we have only measured approach or come on forms of sexual harassment in our prior study and in this one. Uh, so we know that gender harassment or rejection based harassment is much more prevalent. Therefore, we're interested in studying how power priming may affect intentions to engage in other forms of sex harassment. Finally, we want to study possible inventions that would curtail the effect on, on harassment tendencies. And that's a shout out for the lab. This would not be possible without them. All right. Any questions? Okay. Is there any questions? Possibly one or two? All right. No, I guess I'll move it along. Okay. Give me a moment here. Okay, so a few things I should warn you about um, before we start. This talk is going to be about rape. I'll say rape quite a lot. So if you don't like that, you're not gonna like this. Um, and it's, you know, it's difficult to talk about. So be warned, be aware of it. I would also like to really thank the members of my lab, Equalab. I think that's very important. And I'd specifically like to thank Miriam Tashler, one of my students who was the forerunner in this research. So thanks very much to her. If you are interested in contacting me, you can email me or you could get in touch with me much more effectively through Twitter because I don't check my email that often. Okay, so we'll be talking about contact with stereotypical women and how that can reduce rape intentions and rape acceptance. I'll explain what all that means in a bit. I'm Keon West, I'm an associate, I'm an associate. I'm a, I'm a reader at Goldsmiths University of London, and that doesn't translate to the American system. So I'm an associate professor. That's the closest you'll get. Anyway, so first first slide. So rape is, is bad. Um, one would imagine that that's a fairly uncontroversial statement. However, this doesn't appear to be as uncontroversial as you might think. Um, so the psychologists are all very much in agreement that if you get raped, bad things happen. Um, PTSD and depression and substance abuse and you know, suicidal ideation. So nobody likes to be raped. It's very straightforward. Um, however, in the UK, you can find, you know, a couple thousand men who appear to disagree with that assessment. Um, up to 85,000 women are raped in the UK each year, which is quite a lot. And I don't think that these are limited to a handful of rapists doing it. 
Um, in the US, there was a study recently done that found about a third of your university students, male university students, if they could get away with it, would rape someone. And this is an explicit measure. If you knew you could get away with it, would you rape someone? They said yes. And in this research that I also done in the UK, the number was very, very similar. Um, so, you know, look to your left, look to your right, look in front of you, one of them would rape you. That's staggeringly high and quite disturbing. And if you remember the case of Brock Turner, anyone remember Brock Turner? Yep, so he raped somebody, then, you know, he was a really good swimmer or something, I don't know. And because of that, he couldn't go to prison. And then he went to prison, but he was only there for three months. So there was food in your fridge that was there before he went to prison that was still there when he came out and he had raped someone. So apparently not everyone agrees. So the question then is why is there this disagreement about how bad rape is? And you have to understand the sexism behind rape. And we tend to split sexism into two different camps, the kind of hostile sexism and benevolent sexism. And these work in different ways and do different things. Hostile sexism is really, I don't like women. Women are too easily offended. They want to get too much power. Women are trying to make our lives hard. That's a bad, we really don't like them. Benevolent sexism sounds good, but it's also bad. Um, but it has other things in it, like women have a quality of purity that men don't possess, or they should be cherished and protected. Sounds nice, but also has different effects. We're not going to talk about those effects. We'll talk about the hostile stuff because that's really what's interesting here. Um, it's interesting because hostility, so hostility towards women has been shown in the past to predict intentions to rape. Um, so that's very, very important. And it's also bound up in the way that we think about sex and sexuality in a heteronormative culture, where sex is something that a woman holds onto and protects from men who should be hunting it and trying to get it. And women who protect it ineffectively should suffer the consequences. Um, and it's important to see that there are relationships between sexism and rape myth acceptance that have been identified in prior research. So this is important stuff. Um, and when I talk about rape myth acceptance, these are a set of beliefs in particular that are meant to downplay the seriousness of rape. And they're, they're tied into a lot of these other beliefs, and they're supposed to shift the responsibility for rape from the perpetrator, the rapist, to the victim, the person who is raped. You could probably recognize some of these beliefs. Um, so these are taken straight from the scale. So for example, in the majority of rapes, the victim is promiscuous or has a bad reputation. So she's out, she's given it away. So you know, if you want to take some, that's not not a bad thing, it's not your fault. Um, this actually said, something like this was said in the Brock Turner trial. Or when women go around braless or wearing short skirts and tight tops, they're just asking for trouble, um, unspecified trouble. So these are things that some people do agree with. Um, and if you agree with these things and you're a man, you are more likely to then say that you would be okay with raping someone. But it's also important to remember that we can internalize negativity about ourselves. Every group can do this. Black people can do this. Muslims can do this. Gay people can do this. Women can do this. Um, and this is important because women also sometimes believe in these particular rape myths. So you have, you know women who will accept some of these things as true. Um, and there are many reasons for this, but there's you know, a, a vast array of psychological defenses that can be done by accepting these myths. So if you believe that only the slutty girls get raped, I'm not a slutty girl, no one's going to rape me. And now you feel safe when you walk down the street because you know this kind of bad thing isn't going to happen to you. One thing, again, taken straight from the rape myth acceptance scale, um, is the belief that many women have an unconscious wish to be raped, which doesn't make any sense because that's, that's why it's rape. But you know, then they may unconsciously set up a situation in which they're likely to be attacked. So this really takes the idea of rape and shifts it from a violent act or an act of power and prejudice into an act about sex. And that's where the myth comes in. Okay. So what we've got to so far is the idea that if you believe some of these things, so if you accept rape myths, the idea that you know particular people get raped or it's really their fault, then if you're a man, you're more likely to say you're okay with raping someone. And if you're a woman, you're more likely to think that rape is kind of a sexy thing that some people are into rather than a thing nobody wants to happen to them. So that's the central part of this research. And this shows that rape is really about prejudice. It's about power and prejudice. And if only we knew some way of reducing a whole bunch of different types of prejudice. Well, so happens we do, which is fun. Um, so a lot of my research is on intergroup contact. And intergroup contact is an incredibly simple idea that if you're a blue, for example, see the little blues, um, then you tend to think blues are better and smarter and better looking and cooler than greens who are, are so just terrible and greeny and who likes that? But if you are a blue or, or even a green and you interact with someone from a different group, so you make a greeny friend and you interact them, with them for a while, 
then all of these negative things tend to go away. You tend to think that greens are quite a lot better and they're quite a lot nicer. And in fact, they're kind of just like blues after all, which is nice. Um, so contact is great. And I've done a lot of research on how well contact works. I don't want you to look at or care about the details of this. Just take it as an example. Um, some of my own research has found links between contact and reduced prejudice against people with mental health disorders. Other research has found links between contact and reduced sexual prejudice, even in places like Jamaica, where sexual prejudice is really quite high and really quite stable and has no reason to go down. There's really not much of a, a social norm against it. So that's quite good. And that holds even when you take other things into account. And there are huge meta-analyses, which if you care about contact, you should be aware of, that show that it's incredibly effective and it works in a variety of different circumstances. It's also worth noting that contact works better if it meets certain optical, optimal conditions. Now, a dirty secret of the contact um, research arena is that no one really agrees on what these four conditions are, but I'm just going to tell you what they are anyway. Um, but if you look up a different paper, you'll find different ones. But anyway, these are equal status, common goals, uh, intergroup cooperation, and support from authorities. And the one I'm going to focus on is the status one, which I'll explain in a bit. And it is definitely the case that when it meets these optimal conditions, it works better than when it doesn't meet the optimal conditions. Not that it doesn't work when it doesn't, but it works better when it does. Okay. So the question then is, can we use contact to reduce sexism and to reduce, reduce all that rapiness that we were talking about earlier? And that is an interesting question because no one else has ever really looked at it. Now, since then, so since this paper came out, there has been some more research on contact and sexism, but there's a surprising lack of it. There are hundreds of papers on contact and sexual prejudice, for example, and I can't tell you how many. There are possibly thousands on contact and racism, but you can't find contact and sexism, and I'm not entirely sure why. Just speaking off the top of my head, it's, ooh, that's gone. Oh, wow, that's weird. Right, there is a problem, and that had to close. We're gonna close that. I'm just gonna keep speaking. Speaking off the top of my head, I imagine that part of the reason for that is that people treat contact as a thing that has to happen in a special circumstance and contact between men and women is fairly ubiquitous. It's weird if you were a man who has literally never met a woman. That's very, very unusual. Um, in fact, for most of human history, you kind of had to come into the world that way. We have technology now that you don't have to, um, but it's really hard not to do. Thank you. Thank you very much for appreciating that. Okay. <laughs> However, it's not a simple matter of meeting women or having women in your, in your workplace or in your school. Actually, if you remember the optimal conditions of contact, one of them was equal status. And around the world, even in egalitarian countries like yours, um, I assume you live here, um, like yours, most women are not presumed to be in positions of power or status. It's actually normal for women to be subordinate to men. So most contact between men and women is unlikely to be optimal. So if you want to look at the good contact, you need to look at the equal status stuff. So that's the question. If you interact with these high status women, does that reduce your hostile sexism against women your other kinds of sexism against women, and then the general endorsement of or feeling okay about raping women, or if you're a woman, getting raped yourself. So that, that is a central thing that I'm looking at in these particular studies. So it's very, very straightforward. One thing I would point out is that the role of benevolent sexism is a question, it's a question mark, um, because it's not really implicated in a lot of this stuff. But I measured it anyway because I thought it was important. We should look at hostile and benevolent sexism. And there are two studies. Study one is about men. So that's a little blue bubble. I'm very, very normative in there. I apologize. And it's about whether or not they'll rape you. And study two is about women, whether or not you think you'd enjoy it. Okay. So that's study one. Now, of course, caveat of the cross-sectional study can't prove causal relationships, so on and so forth. But you all understand that because everyone's a grown-up. Um, but nonetheless, it's important to look at. So it's a big study, adequately powered with almost 200 British men, asking them exactly the things that we laid out. How often do you interact with women who are equal to or higher status than yourself? Then how much do you accept rape myths? And then how sexist are you? Oh, sorry, flip those. How sexist are you? How much do you accept rape myths? And are you going to rape anyone if you get the chance? Literally, that's it, all explicit stuff. And we did a bit of structural equation modeling, and that's what we found. Um, very good model fit. Those are standardized effects, by the way, so you can take them at face value. And you can see that they're fairly big and they're fairly good. Um, and that there is a reliable set of relationships. The more you interact with women who are at least your status or higher, the less you feel hostile towards women, the less you believe rape myths, and the less likely you are to want to rape someone. 
Study two is essentially exactly the same study, except with British women, where the last outcome measure wasn't how likely are you to rape someone, but just how much do you think you'd like getting raped? Do you think that'd be a fun thing to do? And, you know, again, it's, it's really a question that doesn't make sense. If you'd like it, it's not, I don't think you get what this rape thing is about, but whatever. Some of them said yes, some of them said no. And we wanted to know why, what kind of things would predict that. And in study two, we found very much the same pattern that if you have a boss or if you have someone in your workplace or someone in your university who's more senior than you and a woman, even if you're a woman, it reduces or it's associated with less hostile sexism, less acceptance of rape myths, and a lower likelihood of saying that you think being raped would be kind of cool. So why does that matter? Um, it's, it's very important, so summing it up, you meet high status women, there's less sexism reported, less rape myth acceptance, and less intention to rape and sexualization of rape. This is really important because this is not an information transfer. This is not a lesson about consent. I really doubt that most of these lower status men are talking to their bosses about consent and sexiness and how to have sex. is isn't about that. It shows that this isn't sex at all. This is about anger and prejudice and hostility towards women. And if you can get that down, it changes the way people think about rape. It shows you how much rape is about power and prejudice and not about sex or sexiness at all. Um, it's an interesting finding that benevolent sexism appeared to be completely irrelevant, um, which I didn't really talk about, but was true in the findings. It wasn't related to contact and it was not related to rape myth acceptance or hostility, which you know is funny. Um, and they often are related, they often are, but it doesn't appear to be implicated in this model. Um, there are many interesting theoretical reasons behind that. Maybe contact is generally associated with some kinds of prejudice and not others, but it's something that's worth considering. And also, we're not really sure, because we looked at a specific kind of contact because of the assumption that this specific kind of contact was more ideal or optimal. It's not really clear what would happen if you had more contact with lower status women. Hypothetically, it would simply be a less effective form of contact, in which case maybe you'd still feel less rapey at the end of it. Or, hypothetically, because it reinforces gender norms, you might actually feel more rapey. We don't know. We have no idea. But it might be something worth investigating, because it's an interesting thing to ask. And with that, I come to the end of it. And you know, I hope you found it interesting. Again, if you want to contact me, that's my email address, and that is my Twitter. And I once again would like to thank the members of my lab, who you can also follow on Twitter, and thank Miriam Tashler for pulling the study forward. So thanks very much. That's it. Oh, while we're here, do we have any questions? I do have time. OK, yes, go ahead. Yeah. But I did think as a professor yeah. at a university. Yeah. What about that? I mean, Go on. I'm a high status woman and yeah. I yeah. think that would be helpful, but I also think it's where you get more sexual assault. So maybe yeah. how do we apply this in the university setting? Or maybe they yeah. have to like, write down and figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna say caveat number one you know, all cross-sectional. So no idea if these are really the causal effects. Of course, in the paper, we ran the reverse model. And, I mean, we all know the story, but we did that. It does appear to be in this direction. So hypothetically, it does seem based on the results of the paper that your very existence makes the students you interact with less rapey, which is good, right? I One would hope so. That would be what the, the data would suggest. Um, I don't see the thing you said that because you're a female professor in a position of authority, you get a lot of sexual harassment. I don't see that as being incompatible with the idea that you reduce how sexual harassment generally functions anyway. The kind of black person who goes and gets themselves a university degree is more likely to face some kind of pushback from people for being too uppity but they also simultaneously contribute to an atmosphere in which we are generally believed to be more capable of doing such uppity things. So it's often the case that people in the front line are having good effects, but not necessarily reaping the benefits of these effects themselves. So I, you know, I could see that that sounds really hard, um, and not being a woman, I have no idea what the experience is like, but I'd say keep up the good work. I don't know if that, I don't know if that helps. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions while we're here? You don't have to. I'll I'll count. I'll just count back. Five, four. Okay, we have one. Yes. Yeah.
Could be. Okay, I'm going to slowly back off. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's see if I can figure this out. Escape. Good afternoon, I'm Edward Sullivan, and today I'll be talking to you about allyhood, specifically men's allyhood towards women in the workforce in the era of the Me Too era. So with regards to allyhood at work, I have a definition up here for you, um, and, it re and I'll let you read it on your own, but it does kind of highlight an understanding that allyhood is describing the relationship that men have towards women and in supporting and also in promoting the rights and well-being of women. And in this particular case is with regards to at work. Um, a lot of the relationship um, between men or as the allies and women and so forth, it kind of stems from what we know as the social psychological um, concepts of in-group and out-group and that was also what began our sort of research. And when I say R, I'm referring to Dr. Asia Eden over here, my mentor and our work together. Um, so we were looking at this sort of relationship and one of the things that we want, that we felt was missing or kind of came about was that there was really no way to measure an ally or the, and, or the degree of allyhood in a men towards women at work. And so we set out and developed a scale and use it as a tool in order to identify or measure the degree of allyhood that men have towards women at work. And it's the MAWW, uh, Men's Allyhood Towards Women in the Workplace. So these are the sample items, and I don't mean to have you focus on the items too much here, or not, this isn't gonna be a presentation with regards to all the technical aspects of developing and validating this tale, a scale. In fact, that's probably 90% of what we, um, our efforts were. I'm just going to be discussing with you some of the um, substantive findings as well as the um, outcomes from it. But as you read through here, what really emerges from these, from these particular sample items, which are used in order to measure uh, man's allyhood, is the, how they were factored. So through factor analysis, we ended up with three factors. Um, the first factor is knowledge and awareness. So this, this in, involves the understanding of facts and history and laws um, and customs and norms with regards to um, the women's movement in particular, um, understanding of the patriarchy, how it operates, that we all live in a society, a patriarchal society, um, that men are the beneficiaries of this society and that a man himself um, would be the beneficiary. Having this sort of knowledge and awareness was, was found to be a contributing factor to developing a man's allyhood, meaning that the more a man had these particular, scored higher on the scale items that fell into this particular category, then the more apt they were to support women's equality at work and promote women's equality at work. The second factor we came across of the three is action. So this one, this particular factor emerged as well, and this has to deal with um, behaviors. Um, this would be, you know, just behaviors like displaying a symbol um, of equality or, um, you know, confronting a coworker who may be making derogatory remarks with regards to women or sexist statements um, or participating in a, a women's march, any, anything along the line that requires some sort of overt behavior. And then the third factor that emerged from the development of this scale was the skills and ability that an ally needs. Learn the uh, mastering empathy, being able to listen, developing communication skills, and, and so forth. 
in the era, in the Me Too era, this became, this seems to be very, uh, particularly important because, you know, the Me Too era is really, it's a national dialogue, um, maybe global in many ways, where we're, you know, what used to be tolerated behaviors of the past are no longer, you know, and so a lot of our ground is shifting and uh, our understanding of roles, the norms, and all of these sort of fact, these, uh, the landscape is changing, which in turn is affecting these sort of factors that contribute to a man's allyhood and the development of his allyhood. And these changes as they're being presented for the equality movement, but they're also having a particular impact on allies as well, as these norms and customs and um, the way we behave and the, uh, what is socially acceptable and so forth changes, so too does the allies understanding of what they need to do in order to promote equality and um, in order to support women at work. So a little bit about allyhood development. Um, in our research, the, the, the prominent model with regards to um, understanding allyhood development and it was pretty much a linear model. This was the kind of where you, you, you inherited some sort of young man at a particular stage, usually some sort of tabula rosa, and then through some sort of experience, um, you know, maybe through education or learning about a patriarchy or learning about his place in society and so forth. He begins the understanding. Some of it is internalized by the, the man and then later develops to acquire certain skills, um, communication skills or listening skills. And then continuing along this linear path, um, we would go to the next stage, which might end in some sort of action. So this is the traditional model that's been used. And what we found in our research is that this wasn't, although our research didn't necessarily disagree with this model, it really didn't um, address it straight on. Not to the same way that a factor model, like what I'm talking about now, where we have these three factors that actually kind of make up the identity and are able of for the uh, make up the identity of the ally and also explain the allyhood. Um, and part of the the key thing with regards to these three factors and the difference between the linear model is that you know, especially in the workforce, we're finding that, you know, men come into the situation, uh, come into their environment with so many different life experiences that it's too hard in order to place them at one particular point in their development. For instance, some men have different development stages with regards to their um, education or their understanding of um, the women's movement and what it means for equality, their understanding of the patriarchy. And then some have different degrees of the type of behaviors or the actions that they would participate in. It wouldn't be uncommon for, you know, for a man who may actually consider himself an ally to um, might be fully informed on a number of different um, laws and um, regulations and customs and norms that affect women and also with regards to the to, to the to combat sexism but may not participate in overt behaviors so you know you you get these men that have all these different life experiences and these different sorts and you might also have men that are participating in pro equality and affirming measures or activities, but not necessarily believe that they are a beneficiary of a patriarchy, which is part of the, um, the understanding um, and for the allyhood development. So this brings me to this phrase, you take your ally as you find them. Now, you, before all of this, um, I used to be a lawyer. And actually here in the great state of um, California, there was a famous legal case. Um, there, was a, in, there was an incident where, um, I don't know, there's an accident of some sort of, and you know how you, how you injure a particular party and then you have to pay for the damages. Well, back in the early days, you didn't have to pay for the damages. You only had to pay for what was thought to be what an average person would have experienced. So if you were in a car wreck and you hit someone in, in their car and they br broke their leg, but the average person would only have caught away with a the bruise, then you would only have to pay the amount for the bruise. Well, there was a famous case um, where the judge ruled and changed it, which was then took place throughout all of the United States, um, is that you take your plaintiff as you find them and you pay for the full amount. And I find that's a little bit, uh, that's applicable here as well, where we're dealing with, um, 
with when we're talking with our allies, uh, talking about allies, is that we need to kind of start maybe thinking about we have to take our allies where how we find them because they're all going to come. Our research is showing that they're coming at us from all different levels of development. Um, so it kind of brings to some practical solutions. I just wanted to leave you with that. Um, I know that I had I recently had um, come across an article that. Um, where a feminist, she was, you know, she was venting her frustration um, with her, with allies. And you, if you've read these articles here and there, um, you know, maybe you've even written some of them. And I get it. And you know, because there's the whole idea of that, you know, you know, here women are, they're they're on the front lines, they're, they're fighting sexism, and they're having to not only fight it, but also they're the, they're experiencing the set the direct setbacks because of sexism. And then meanwhile, you know, here way in the back, you know, you got your allied forces, you know, here, here I am, what can I do? And, you know, and as many women might find that to be, you know, particularly annoying, um, you know, was when they're all caught up in the drama and the chaos of dealing with sexism, that they're also having to manage allies or at least tend to them or spoon feed them what needs to be done. So, in, in a sense, I get that, but also, you know, in light of the Me Too era, you know, as these things are changing for our understanding of um, sexism and our, um, and like I said before, as the behaviors that have once tolerated are no longer, um, so, too the, so too is this shifting ground for the allies. So what sort of practical solutions might we have for you, uh, might, I, I might be able to offer that may stem from our research? Um, well, I wish I could give you a pocket-sized version of the MAWW. I mean, you could just flip that out, and if a guy come across, you can administer it to him, and you tell him what it, you know, tell him where he stands on his development and what his next stage <laughs> needs to be. But we know that's not really going to be a practical solution. So one thing that we might, and also we, in light of what we want to make sure is that our allies are self-sustaining. You know, that they, they're not having to be spoon fed, that they know what needs to be done and that they can do it and they can develop and they know what needs to be done next week and the next month and that they can develop themselves in order to move forward. So my suggestion would be the next time, um, you know, an ally asks you, what can I do? You can tell them, well, you know, the next time you use a march in your city, um, attend it and bring five guys. <laughs> And the reason why I, I the reason why I think that is I know that's kind of a little, you know it's a little quick and dirty and I, I mean it to be that way but also because it does call upon again that in group out group um, sort of relationship because one of the characteristics of the in group in this case the men is their ability to persuade or be able to exert influence over other men. And in some ways, that might be an untapped resource that we should be, feel more comfortable calling upon men in order to tell them to rally other men and to bring them along. And the way this might contribute to a certain degree towards um, the self-sufficiency is because if, you, if I were a man and I were tasked with that, then I would have to make sure that I had the communication skills in order to talk to my brothers. I would need to in order to make sure that I had, I was modeling the appropriate behavior so that my fellow men would see how, what is the appropriate way to behave as in the workforce and also as the changing definitions of our, in, in the Me Too era. And as well as, you know, I need to stay on top of um, the knowledge and awareness of what is happening in, um, in our society. So that way you can bring forth this. But also it goes that, you know, the more allies we have, the, the less opponents we may have. So thank you very much, and I'll take any questions. Sure. So the question is asking about um, <clears throat> the actual um, 
construct validity in order which is necessary in order to validate a scale and that's part of the technical aspect that i didn't get into but totally yes um you know that was an essential component of that um what we did is this scale when it was administered to the test sub the subject populations that it was also um like-minded scales were also administered um to that to those populations as well as i like the social dominant dominance um, orientation scale, scales that we thought that the scores might turn out to be different. And because it um, did score in those in the in the predicted directions, then that did add to the validity of the scale. But another thing we found was the um, the knowledge and awareness factor was was the most predictive um, factor um, of allyhood. And meaning that the more a man is knowledgeable and aware of the history and customs and the women's movement and patriarchy and his role in it, the more likely he is to demonstrate um, allied behaviors. Yeah, I think that it's. Um, I mean, obviously, the, the it's it, the movement has been is led by women. I think allies, for the most part, get that. I mean, but on the other hand, there are going to be occasions where they might not. Um, it was interesting though when when part of this part of developing this scale where it requires us to come up with items and then distribute them to others. Um, in particular, it was um, um, a feminist um, women in this particular case. And that was one of the things that they said to make sure in the, court, in the course of our wording was that when you're offering as a resource as a man, not to be, not to suggest that it was you know, just jumping in and taking over and doing all of that in a sort of helpful sort of spirit, but yet nonetheless it robs um, the opportunity, but instead to be a resource that is available should you be called upon. And that's actually built into the scale in order to make sure they kind of have that distinction to help release a little bit of that tension. Um, but I do think it's something that both allies and women um, should all need to keep in mind moving forward in order to make sure that the, the relationship stays productive. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my pleasure. The knowledge base, which was the most important part of the allergy, was that self-assessed knowledge or was that externally assessed knowledge? Or it, I think I know a lot about the women's movement, or did you actually check how much they knew and how much they knew? No, it was self-assessed. So this would all self-reporting. Did they do? Were they familiar with reports? Were they um, aware that um, you know at one time in history you could be, um, you know, a woman could be terminated because she was pregnant, terminated from her work, and so forth? But it really didn't get. I mean, that is something that we um, that would be part of a future um, would be kind of to narrow it down to see what apart from what are they claiming to be their knowledge, but to actually then to test it. Um, but that was not part of this particular research project. But you sound like someone on my dissertation committee. <laughs> well, anyways, my pleasure and thank you. And I'm really enjoying the conference and um, this is my first time and I'm having a terrific time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. My name is Abby Fulberg. Um, this was work that was conducted in conjunction with Carrie Ryan at the University of Nebraska. Oh, you can't hear me because I'm tiny. <laughs> Omaha, <laughs> can you hear me now? Okay, and uh, Jen Hunt at the University of Kentucky. So what I'd like to present is that she doth not protest too much, uh, tolerance of sexism among women and men. 
So Ed's presentation, or Edward's, sorry, presentation touched on the Me Too movement and other presentations in this symposium are clearly relevant to it. And one of the things that really struck us about reporting on the Me Too movement was it that it didn't just chronicle the behavior of bad actors like Harvey Weinstein or Matt Lauer, but individuals around those perpetrators knew about sexist behavior. And for whatever reason, they failed to intervene. And not only did they fail to intervene, but a lot of times they acted in ways that legitimized or facilitated that behavior. So for example, uh, Arnold Klopinger, a former executive at CBS out of Les Moonves, I don't care if 30 more women come forward and allege this stuff, Les is our leader and it wouldn't change my opinion of him. Likewise, Senator Orrin Hatch uh, said of Brett Kavanaugh when he was nominated to the Supreme Court, Brett Kavanaugh is a great man and a great judge. He loves his family, his church, baseball, burgers, and coaching his daughter's basketball team. And finally, in recent reporting, uh, or in a recent interview on his reporting on R. Kelly, Jim DeRogata said, I'd like to know how Clive Calder, Ed Genson, how the managers and concert industry promoters who worked with Kelly, how they look at themselves in the mirror. By refusing to derail the gravy train, they allowed this man to continue because it was money. It was money that allowed him to prey on these girls. In other words, what these statements suggest was that individuals were readily willing to tolerate sexism, and they did so because they thought perhaps maybe being a good person excuses some sexist behavior, or because other people's sexism is their business. It's not my place to intervene. And so we wanted to create a measure of tolerance of sexism, in other words, a willingness to accept sexist views and behaviors in others that reflected those beliefs. For example, the belief that somebody can be a good person even if they have some sexist views, or that you can't tell other people what to believe even if they're sexist. And this is the uh, final measure that we have up here after some measurement analyses. So when we thought about how uh, we wanted to conceptualize this measure, we thought tolerance of sexism is an individual difference. Some people are likely higher on this measure than others. And it affects individuals' interpretations of sexist acts and the perpetrators who commit them. And therefore it might guide their behavioral responses towards those acts. We also thought there's reason to believe that this is a fairly widely spread attitude. So we know that even if people disapprove of sexism, they rarely confront it. And this is perhaps because we have some strong social norms suggesting that a lot of times it's better to go along to get along. In other words, we don't wanna be seen as a troublemaker or a complainer. We also wanted to think about how might tolerance of sexism differ from other previously validated measures of sexism. So we thought, Tolerance of sexism. We thought <laughs> that. <laughs> and from current slide. Yay, that it's a more subtle form of bias than say um, hostile sexism, that it assesses tolerance of others' attitudes and behaviors rather than directly assessing individuals' evaluation of target group members, but that it likely reflects tolerance of hostile rather than benevolent attitudes towards women. This is because often people don't uh, tend to perceive benevolent sexism as sexism. So we thought tolerance of sexism is legitimizes the status quo, it maintains the status quo by legitimizing sexism and condoning gender inequality. And we thought then it's likely associated with different attitudes and target group evaluations among women and men. This is consistent with work on system justification theory, suggesting that higher and lower status groups might have different reasons for justifying the status quo and might also have uh, different patterns of target group evaluations. So we thought among women, it might be more strongly associated with ideologies that would justify the status quo. In this case, we chose gender specific system justification. This is consistent with literature suggesting that priming women in particular with say benevolent sexism or complementary gender stereotypes increases their system justifying ideologies. We also thought it might be associated with the tendency to positively evaluate men. Among men, we thought maybe tolerance of sexism emerges as a function to protect men's dominant status. And so it might be more strongly associated with ideologies that protect that status or signal concerns about status threat. In this case, we chose zero sum beliefs about gender equality. In other words, belief that gains in equality for women must necessitate losses in equality for men. And we thought it might be associated with the tendency to negatively evaluate women. 
So we've done a, a couple studies. I'm only going to present one today. In this particular study, we collected data from 301 participants. A little over half were men. Uh, they range in age from 20 to 71 years old, with a mean age of about 36 years old. The majority were white and had completed at least some college education. And they just completed a variety of attitude measures on a one to seven Likert scale. So we have a, a measure of tolerance of sexism, 10 item pool, seven item final measure, short form measures of hostile and benevolent sexism, measure of gender specific system justification, social dominance orientation, right wing authoritarianism, and zero sum beliefs about gender equality. We also asked participants to complete a feeling thermometer task where they rated how warmly or coolly they felt about a variety of target groups uh, on a zero to 100 scale with um, higher values indicating warmer feelings. So the first thing that we wanted to do was to make sure that we weren't reinventing the wheel. That is that tolerance of sexism factors separately um, from hostile and benevolent sexism. And indeed it does. This is our final exploratory structural equation model that exhibited excellent fit. And what it indicated was that tolerance of sexism was associated with hostile and benevolent sexism as we expected, but that the associations weren't so strong that they indicated the absence of discriminant validity. In fact, the association between hostile sexism and benevolent sexism was stronger than the associations of tolerance of sexism to either measure. And again, this is our final um, seven item scale after the measurement analyses. Next, we wanted to examine uh, gender differences in our focal measures. So we have uh, tolerance of sexism, hostile and benevolent sexism, system justification and zero sum beliefs. Women are in blue, men are in gray. And what we found were significant gender differences indicating that men endorse tolerance of sexism, hostile sexism, and zero sum beliefs about gender equality more than did women. It's a little hard to see on this side with the uh, bars for both women and men, but uh, mean endorsements of tolerance of sexism were comparatively much higher than endorsements of either hostile or benevolent sexism, uh, suggesting that it might be somewhat less susceptible to social desirability biases. In fact, the mean endorsement of tolerance of sexism was significantly higher than the midpoint of the scale indicating that generally participants were more tolerant than intolerant of sexism. Next, we examine the associations of tolerance of sexism to uh, uh, evaluations of target women and men. So if we start at the top of the target groups, we have women in general, women in non-traditional roles, for example, career women or feminists, women in traditional roles, stay-at-home moms. Then we have men, men in traditional roles, so career men, and men in non-traditional roles, stay-at-home dads. Uh, these are zero-order correlations that I'm presenting. These associations remain when controlling for both hostile and benevolent sexism. And what we found was that tolerance of sexism is associated with negative evaluations of women in uh, non-traditional roles. So this sort of indicated to us it likely assesses tolerance of hostile attitudes towards women. And it was also associated with the tendency to favor men in order to, in other words, to more warmly evaluate men and men in traditional roles specifically. When we looked at these evaluations uh, by participant gender, what we found is that the association between tolerance of sexism and evaluations of men was primarily driven by women's scores. In fact, it was uh, significantly more strongly associated with positive evaluations of men uh, among female participants. But it wasn't necessarily the case that um, men who were high in, higher in tolerance of sexism were more likely to derogate women than were women. We also wanted to see if it was uh, more strongly associated with justifying ideologies among women and zero sum beliefs among men. So we regressed both ideologies separately on a tolerance of sexism, hostile and benevolent sexism, social dominance orientation and right wing authoritarianism. We also controlled for participant ethnicity. And what we found was a significant gender by tolerance of sexism interaction, indicating that higher tolerance of sexism was uh, uh, associated with stronger gender specific system justification beliefs and that was stronger for female participants than for male participants. But the corresponding interaction was only marginally significant for zero sum beliefs. So it was the case that among men, zero sum beliefs was marginally more strongly associated with tolerance of sexism, uh, although neither of those simple effects is significantly different from zero. Um, so take it with a grain of salt. So in sum, we developed a measure of tolerance of sexism, this subtle form of bias that's distinct from both hostile and benevolent sexism. It likely assesses tolerance of hostile rather than benevolent attitudes towards women, and it justifies the status quo by condoning gender inequality. 
We also found gender differences in the associations of tolerance of sexism to attitudes and target group evaluations, such that among women, it was more strongly associated with system justifying beliefs and more positive evaluations of men. And among men, it was only marginally more strongly associated with uh, zero sum beliefs. And as we were looking at the, how this measure behaved in other samples, what we started to see was that the effects of tolerance of sexism more generally appear to be stronger for women than they appear to be for men. So we collected some data after the 2018 midterm elections and saw that it was uh, more strongly associated with support for Trump and Republican candidates among women versus men and more strongly associated with positive versus negative affect directed at conservatives among women versus men. And this led us to ask, why is that? Why is that when we find uh, interactions with participant gender that the effects tend to be stronger for women? We thought, well, perhaps um, sexism is perceived more seriously among women than men, and perhaps merely tolerating sexism isn't enough to allay fears about loss of status for men. Perhaps they need more overt expressions of sexism. It also might be the case that women who are higher in tolerance of sexism identify more strongly with traditional gender roles. So perhaps um, they're more likely to tolerate or direct hostile sexism at women in non-traditional roles uh, for women with whom they might not strongly identify. Perhaps they're also more strongly attuned to gender role violations and therefore more willing to uh, tolerate sexism. We also thought it's possible that these effects um, might also depend on participant ethnicity, as they, that the effects of tolerance of sexism might depend on the intersection between uh, participant gender and race. So we didn't really have enough uh, ethnic minority participants here to really test whether whites differed um, from, say, uh, black women or uh, Latinx women. But there's been some really interesting research on white women in particular support for Trump. Um, some of that research indicates that they tie their fates to those of white men and that the privilege of Supported to them by their ethnicity sort of outweighs the detriments of sexism. Perhaps this is because some research indicates that white women are more likely to be the beneficiaries of benevolent sexism than are, say, black women. So the perceived benefits of benevolent sexism allow them to um, endorse hostile sexism. Of course, uh, these data are not without limitations. They are cross-sectional. I can't offer any causal relationships. I also treated uh, both target gender and participant gender as if it were binary, but of course the expression of gender is much more complicated than that. But I think there are some interesting future directions that we could take this data. So the first is that because tolerance of sexism predicts individuals' attitudes towards perpetrators, it might be useful in predicting confronting behaviors. It also may be the case that individuals who are high and tolerant of sexism may have some unique affective responses to sexism. This is consistent with some work on aversive racism, indicating that aversive racists, that is those who are um, low in explicit prejudice, but high in implicit prejudice, uh, have some unique affective responses in, uh, to racism. And we also wanted to more closely examine the associations of tolerance of sexism among women. So does that operate as a function of benevolent sexism, uh, intersectionality? Does it perhaps operate as a function of uh, identification? Um, so we'll see. Uh, but thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Question about observation. Sure. Tying in some of the themes of your papers, um, it, uh, the Swiss paper finds that um, a good form of power actually increases the likelihood of sexually harassed. Your paper is showing that um, uh, women who tolerate sexism um, are permitting, you know, sex behavior as well as men. But the striking finding there, I think, was your moderation for women. And, um, it, it's sad, you know, that these things that we thought would be helpful, that you know, why wouldn't a woman um, just be insist over the sexist acts of famous people, some of the more influential powerful positions. Um, Keon's research with contacts suggests that that might be one possible solution for us. So I, just have, I saw some trends and some things across the paper that are discouraging.